Hi. Uh, this lecture and the next one are about the uh, heat equation. In this lecture, um, we'll talk about the model which comes up with the uh, partial differential equation called the heat equation. And um, we'll also um, indicate why Fourier series are going to be helpful in solving the natural kind of uh, problems called initial boundary value problems that arise when you study the heat equation. And in the uh, next lecture, we'll do some uh, more in-depth examples. All the key ideas are, are in this one, and uh, hopefully at the end we'll even go to Desmos and look a little look at a little movie of um, heat flowing through uh, a rod. Okay, so to warm up, um, I want to show you a nice generalization of eigenvectors and eigenvalues that uh, we know and love from linear algebra. And uh, to answer this warm-up exercise, all you have to do is remember everything you learned about homogeneous second-order differential equations in chapter 3. So we are looking for functions, and I'm writing them as capital X of the variable little x, so that for some number lambda, um, x double prime is just lambda times x, and we want our functions to uh, not to solve a, a, an initial value problem, but what's called a boundary value problem. We want our functions to be uh, have the value 0 when the variable little x is 0 and when it's capital L, and the domain that we're interested in is the interval from 0 to capital L. Now, uh, these functions are called eigenfunctions, for the operator, uh, L of a function is the second derivative of the function, and also for the specified uh, boundary conditions, which is that we want the functions to be zero on each endpoint. And the solutions are called eigenpairs. So the idea of eigenvalue and eigenvector extends to um, operators on uh, linear operators on function spaces. Okay, so uh, let's let's do this problem. All right, so this is a second order DE that we know about with constant coefficients. It's homogeneous. I'll rewrite it as capital X double prime minus lambda capital X equals zero, where lambda is a constant. And so, um, depending on whether lambda is a positive, negative, or zero, we get different kinds of solutions. So, let's call it case zero when lambda equals zero. Well, that would mean that capital X double prime was zero, so capital X was just of the form ax plus b. But if we also want capital X of 0 and capital X of L to be 0, uh, capital X of x, not capital, was ax plus b. So um, at 0, I would get B, and that would have to be 0, and therefore capital X of L would just be AL, which would imply that A was 0. So in K0, there are no solutions. And of course, we're interested only in non-zero solutions. Okay, let's do case one.
where lambda is negative. Well, then we can rewrite uh, lambda as negative omega naught squared, thinking back to what we used to do in chapter 3, and <laughs> ever since. And then the DE is x double prime plus omega naught squared, capital X, is 0. And we want x of 0 to be 0 and capital X of L to be 0. Well, we know, we better know the solutions to this DE. They're linear combinations of cos omega naught t and sine omega naught t. Okay, well, if capital X of zero is uh, going to be zero, that means that C1 has to be zero. Because when I plug T equals zero into the formula, I just get C1. And then if capital X of L is zero, that will just be C2 sine omega naught L. So omega naught, omega naught L will have to be a multiple of pi. So um, the omega naughts will have to be pi over L times N. And, um, okay, so in other words, uh, our solutions to this um, uh, eigenvector, eigenvalue problem are that we actually get uh, um, um, <laughs> lambda n's, which are pi over L times n. So uh, probably I shouldn't have called those omega naughts. I just should have called them omegas to not be confused. And so for every n, we got a different omega n. Okay, so the lambda n's are negative negative pi over L n squared and we get corresponding eigenfunctions x capital N of little x, which are multiples of sine of pi over L n, that's the omega n, times x. Okay, so there is a whole list of eigenfunctions with their eigenvalues for the operator um, L of X is X double prime and subject to the boundary conditions that X of 0 and X of L are 0. Let's do the last case. It could be that lambda was positive and in that case um, Let's write it down again. So it's x double prime minus lambda capital X equals zero. Capital X of zero is zero. Capital X of L is zero. In that case, the homogeneous solutions, um, the characteristic polynomial is r squared minus lambda. So we will get um, e to the square root of lambda x and 
e to the minus the square root of lambda x. If capital X at 0 is supposed to be 0, c1 plus c2 have to be 0. If capital X at L is also supposed to be 0, that's c1 e to the root lambda L plus c2 e to the minus root lambda L has to be 0. You can see that, so it's a, a linear system of two equations and two unknowns. The, the matrix, which is 1, 1, the first exponential, and then the second exponential, uh, the two rows are not multiples of each other, so it's invertible. It's two independent equations. So the C1 and the C2 have to be 0, and so we get no solutions in this case. Okay, let's summarize. We were looking for eigenfunctions of the operator L of x is x double prime. Um, we were looking at the special case where these functions satisfied the zero boundary conditions at little x equals zero and L. And we found a list of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. And they were sinusoidal trig functions where the angular frequencies were such that the signs were zero at both endpoints. Okay, now take a breath and um, just store that. Let's talk about the heat equation. Um, a great place to learn about it initially is Wikipedia. So it's used in physics and math and probability theory. It's, uh, it's a partial differential equation. That just means it's an equation for a function of several variables and partial derivatives of that function. And it describes how the distribu distribution of some quantity like heat evolves over time in a solid medium as it moves from places where the value of the function is higher, and so you should actually be thinking of heat uh, measured by temperature, towards places where it is lower. Uh, there's a generalization. Um, called the diffusion equation. So Joseph Fourier first developed the heat equation to describe heat flow, and um, it has lots of applications and, and generalizations all over the place. We will look at the easiest case of the heat equation. It's the one-dimensional, and that means one space dimension, like the variable x in R. Uh, so we'll be considering functions u of xt, where x is in some interval between 0 and L, and t is time. t is greater than or equal to 0. And here is the heat equation. Uh, it's a homogeneous partial differential equation because the operator L of u equals uh, du dt minus k second partial of u with respect to x squared. That's a linear operator, and um, we're looking for this, the functions which make this the zero function. And you'll notice I use the convention we've already been using just to save writing that when I write a u sub t, I mean du dt, and when I write a u sub xx, I mean the second x partial derivative. Okay, k is called the diffusivity constant or the thermal diffusivity. Um, larger values of k correspond to quicker diffusion. So let me just draw a 
a really uh, so let's suppose that this is a graph of u at x at some time t1 so you can see that u sub t depends on u sub xx, which is measuring concavity. So in this picture, uh, the u sub t's would have been um, negative all along this part of the curve. But if I had a longer interval, then on that part of the curve where the graph was concave up, the uh, use of t's would have been positive, and they're more or less positive or negative depending on use of xx and on this, this thermal diffusivity constant k. And the bigger k is, it's always a positive number, the bigger it is, the, m the greater use of t is. So the, the faster the temperature changes. And the smaller it is, the slower the temperature changes. And so, for example, in this chart, concrete is a great insulator. Heat has a hard time flowing through a concrete wall, which can be measured uh, one-dimensionally, just in terms of the direction um, perpendicular to the wall. Where is metals? Uh, heat moves through metals much more quickly, so they have much bigger values for K. Okay, so in this chapter, in this class, we're going to focus on the homogeneous heat equation, but you could uh, be adding heat to the system depending on where you were in the rod and what time it was with a function uh, F of XT, and that would be the non-homogeneous heat equation, and as usual, for the non-homogeneous linear heat equation, you could write all solutions as a particular solution plus the general homogeneous solution. And if you take um, partial differential equations courses, which are spend a whole semester on PDEs, then you'll certainly talk about that. Okay, so let's explain where the heat equation comes from. So just to visualize something, visualize a rod, uh, essentially one-dimensional cross-sectional area A. The rod is of length L, and so our number axis goes from 0 to L. And we're going to write down a formula for the total heat in the rod, and heat is a measurement of kinetic energy. Uh, think of vibrating molecules. And the kinetic energy uh, that they store. And to begin with, let's talk about absolute temperature, degrees Kelvin, because you know at absolute zero, nothing is moving. Uh, and we'll see that we can use any temperature scale we want later on. So the total temperature, the total energy in the test interval, yeah, so now we're going to look at a small test interval from R to S inside uh, the interval 0 to L. And we're going to compute the total energy in that interval. So let's, we work from right to left. So the cross-sectional area times, uh, and the, the total energy is going to be an integral from R to X. So in a, a subpiece of length dx, the total uh, volume in that subpiece is the cross-sectional area times the length dx, that's the dv. So for example, cubic centimeters could be potential units. Then when we multiply by the density, which is mass per volume, or grams per cubic centimeters, we will get the mass in that little piece, dm. 
say in grams, because grams per cubic centimeter times cubic centimeter is grams. The specific heat is the amount of energy per gram that it takes to heat something by one degree uh, Celsius, if you're using those units. And so if we multiply the total mass of that little piece in grams times the specific heat in calories per gram, we will get the energy required to um, uh, heat that little piece by one degree. And then if we multiply that by the temperature, we've got the amount of energy uh, stored in that little piece. And then when we add up all of those energies, we get the energy in the whole piece. And so that's what capital E of T is representing. Okay, so now here is the model that will give us the heat equation. Um, we are assuming that uh, this rod is isolated laterally, or it's in air where heat doesn't flow away very quickly, or even better yet, it's in a vacuum. So the only way the heat can uh, leave that little test piece is through the endpoints at R and S. And we're assuming something like Newton's law of cooling, um, how fast the temperature can flow through the ends is proportional to um, U sub x. So it's proportional to the temperature gradient at the ends. So if I was to draw a little piece of the graph from R to S, then the only way the energy can leave is th either through R at the point, at the end at R or the end at S. And you can see from this picture that if U sub X was positive, then because heat flows from hot to cold, I, energy would be flowing in, and uh, as in the picture. And if uh, U sub X at R was positive, then energy would be flowing out, and the net flow would be u sub x uh, at s minus u sub x at r. And um, so that explains the signs in this model. And similarly, if uh, u sub x at s uh, was positive, then it's hotter inside the rod than outside. Uh, sorry, if u sub x at s was negative, then it's uh, hotter inside than outside, so uh, heat flows out at S, uh, and so on. Okay, so uh, the total energy is the integral that we wrote down earlier, and its time derivative is the heat flux through the boundaries. The T in the integral does not appear on the fixed endpoints, just in the integrand. And so then you can justify moving the D by DT through the integral sign to the inside. That's just really because um, integrals are limits of Riemann sums. And the time derivative of such a sum is the sum of the time derivatives. And Uh, the difference of u sub x's on the right can be written as the integral of u sub xx from r to s using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So then we have this identity which holds for all test intervals from r to s. And the only way it can hold, assuming the integrands are continuous, is if the integrands actually agree. So the u sub t times those constants has to be that other constant ka times the u sub xx. One way to make that precise, since we've been using average values, 
is to divide both sides of that equation by the length of the interval. So uh, uh, you're actually dividing it by s minus r, so you're timesing it by 1 over s minus r. And then in the limit, say as uh, s goes to r, the left side will converge to the integrand at, uh, at r, and the right side will converge to that integrand at r, and so you get this equation. You can divide out the cross-sectional areas and solve for u sub t, and you get that equation, and you just call the constants uh, capital K, uh, little c, and delta, uh, capital K over C delta, you just call that little k, and here is the heat equation that we wanted to get. All right, so as I said, this is a homogeneous uh, partial differential, linear partial differential equation, and so if one solution solves it, you can multiply it by a constant C1 and it will still solve it. Constants solve this uh, PDE because all the partial derivatives are zero. So once you have a solution, you can take any linear combination of it with one and you'll get another solution. So uh, the heat equation totally works if you're measuring in Celsius or Fahrenheit instead of uh, Kelvin. Okay, and uh, as I said, we're not going to study the non-homogeneous problem, but we have all the tools we need to do it if we had more time. Let's talk about the two most uh, common and basic initial boundary value problems. Which from now on, we always just abbreviate with IBVP, Initial Boundary Value Problems. Okay, and uh, we are looking for functions u of xt, which are defined for x going from 0 to L and for all positive time. These functions are supposed to satisfy the heat equation. And uh, the initial part of the IBVP is that we always specify the value of the temperature at time zero. So u of x zero equals f of x for um, all x from zero to L. The B part of the IBVP is the boundary values part. And so we'll say something about what u of 0t is and what u of lt is. In type 1, we're concerned with the boundary values and we're fixing them. So it's typical to say that u of 0t and u of lt are identically 0. Now using superposition, you could have um, different sorts of boundary values besides constant ones and also besides constant ones equal to zero. But uh, as I say, we don't have that much time in this sort of uh, flavor of PDEs portion of our course to do that. So our type one boundary conditions will always be zero temperature uh, at either endpoint. So for example, if you want to think of something physical, maybe your rigid rod is uh, soaked in ice water at either end. The other type of boundary value problem is the zero flux um, boundary condition. And again, we're choosing it to be zero instead of some other prescribed function, just for simplicity, and because it's the most natural. So this would correspond to insulated ends and you'll notice it's a condition on the u sub x's at, um, uh, at 
I didn't write that right. It's at, at zero t and at l t. In other words, remember that the heat flux in our test interval was proportional to u sub x. So if the u sub x is zero, there is no heat flux. And this, as I say, can arise if we have insulated ends. Okay, so in either type 1 or type 2 situations, and we'll study both, uh, we will end up building solutions out of product solutions, functions of x times functions of t. And somehow, in a way, in a way which will start becoming clear today, this will tie into Fourier series. So as the key first step, let's find all product solutions for the type 1 boundary condition. So here we want uh, u of 0, t to always be 0, and u of l, t to always be 0. So let's assume that u is a function of x times a function v of t. And the heat equation, I'll write it down here so we don't have to keep scrolling back up, is ut is k uxx. And the number little k is positive. OK, so let's just plug our product function in. Well, when we take the t partial of capital X times little v, we'll just cap capital X at x times v prime of t. That's supposed to equal k times the second x partial of capital X times little v, which is just k times capital X double prime at x times v of t. Okay. If we are at any location where um, both capital X and little v are not zero, then we can divide um, both sides by their product. We will get so I'm dividing by capital X. And I'm also dividing by little v of t. Okay, now think about what this um, identity is saying. So if I just held t fixed at some point where v was non-zero, I could then move x all I wanted, and the right-hand side would have to stay constant. So in other words, the right-hand side would have to be a, a constant function of x. And similarly, if I was at any point where capital X uh, was not zero, I could move the t's and the, the v prime over v of t's would have to stay the same as I did that. So the conclusion from this separated equation, and this process is called separation of variables, is that uh, v prime of t over v is uh, always some constant lambda and so is uh, k x double prime over x. Well, let me not call it lambda. Let me call it c <laughs> for constant. Uh, and when we did this, we were assuming that neither little v or capital X were 0. But if you just multiply back through, then you get identities which have to hold um, also when little v and little x aren't zero. But assuming they're continuous and are just zero at isolated points, they have to hold everywhere. OK. So we get this equation. And so now let's focus on capital X double prime over capital X. 
That'll be a constant, uh, C over K. Let's call that lambda to articulate with the warm-up exercise. So capital X double prime multiplying through by capital X and simplifying minus lambda capital X has to be zero. And if we go to the warm-up exercise, Uh, and as well, we were doing the um, the, f the fixed endpoint condition, so uh, capital X of X, so capital X of 0, V of T has to be identically 0, and capital X of L, V of T, has to be identically zero. So we also knew that capital X of zero is zero, and capital X of L is zero. And so we get the solutions um, uh, Xn of t um, equals, it was the sign n, pi over L X's and the lambda was minus N pi over L squared because when you take two derivatives of capital XN you get back that, ta that number times capital XN so that's what the capital X's have to be and now we're trying to get the product solution U of XT which is capital X of X times V of T so going back to this uh, separated equation V prime of T over V of T, and we're doing this for each N, for each XN, has to be K times XN double prime over X, which is negative N pi over L squared. And so uh, that's V prime equals this stuff, which is all just a constant, no matter how messy it looks, times V. V prime is a multiple of V. The solutions are exponentials. V of T is a constant times E to the minus... I, my minus sign was in the wrong place. V of t is a decaying exponential e to the minus k times n pi over L squared times T. And so the final answer for this type 1 is that we get functions un of x and t, which are sine of n pi over L x times e to the minus k n pi over l squared t. Okay, so that's for type 1, where 
we want the temperature at the boundary to stay zero. We could totally do the type 2 analysis as well. So for type 2, uh, the product solutions they would end up needing that capital X prime of X is zero at X equals zero and L in order to satisfy the zero flux condition. And the solutions we'd get, it's, uh, you just copy the same analysis and the sines just turn into cosines. So the solutions would be UN of xt equals cosine of n pi over lx times e to the minus k n pi over l squared t. And uh, it makes total sense because when you take partial of, with respect to x of one of those cosine guys, you get a sign, and at the endpoints, you'll get a zero. Okay, so um, that was a long discussion, but it is the meat of what we're going to need to know for the heat equation. And on the next page, I just wrote out a, a summary. So if we're trying to solve the type 1 initial boundary value problem, our building block product solutions will be sine of n pi over L x's times a decaying exponential, as written. If we're trying to do the type 2, the building blocks are uh, cosine of n pi over L x is times the same exponentials. And if we had a given uh, initial temperature distribution, f of x, then we know um, uh, how to do even and odd extensions. And if we did an odd extension to the interval minus L to L and then to all of our of f, we would get a sine series for f. So we could write f as a sine series, and then uh, we could use our building blocks, which extend the initial temperature sine n pi over Lx into a function of x and t by multiplying by the corresponding decaying exponential, and we could write down a formula for u of xt, right, at, uh, using those sine series. Um, it would solve the PDE, uh, if we're allowed to differentiate the whole sum by, differenti by, by adding up the sum of the um, partial derivatives. And at t equals 0, we just get back the sine series for f, so that's the sense in which we've solved the initial temperature distribution. And we do exactly the same thing if we're doing the zero flux boundary condition. Um, we do an even extension of the in initial temperature distribution and then we get a cosine series for the initial temperature distribution and then we just um, use our building blocks uh, with those exponentials which give at t equals zero just the number one to build the entire solution. So in the next lecture, we will do that in detail for the following two examples, uh, which are also worked out in the textbook. So here is a type 1 example. Initially, the temperature of our rod is 100 degrees on the entire rod. At time t equals 0, the ends are put into ice water baths so that the um, temperature 
afterwards, so it's uh, ut uh, equals k u x x and uh, oh, I don't even remember <laughs> the, the interval anymore, but we'll do it in the next lecture. The, the point is that for all later time, so u of x0 is identically 100. Uh, initially, but for all later time, the ends are in ice water so that the temperature is zero. And in this picture, you can see that the heat is uh, getting sucked out of the ends, and as T goes to infinity, the temperature goes down to zero. Um, it takes a long time because I believe in this example we're using uh, the concrete diffusivity constant. The second example we'll do will be zero heat flux, and our initial uh, temperature distribution will be a tent function. And in that case, what happens is, because heat can't flow out of either end, uh, eventually the temperature uh, becomes the same everywhere and it's the average temperature that you started with and that's what's being illustrated in this picture. All right, so here is a final um, concrete example and after we do it we will go to Desmos and look at what the solution looks like. Um, as a little tiny movie. So here we are. This is our initial boundary value problem. It is type 1. Our building blocks for type 1 of the form, well, and our interval is, uh, well, so in general, they are sine n pi over L x multiplied by e to the minus k n pi over L squared t. So for us, um, uh, our L is pi, so pi over L is 1, and so these are just sine nx's, and so our uh, u of x0 that we've been calling f of x is just 2 sine x minus sine of 2x. Our heat equation is just ut equals 1 times uxx, so our k is 1. And so our solutions, it's so simple once you get the hang of it. You just take each piece of your type 1 solution, and you extend it for t positive by multiplying by the exponential e to the minus Okay, so in this, so k is 1, we have sine x, so n is 1, pi over l is 1, so this is just e to the minus t, minus sine of 2x, so here the n is 2, the pi over l was 1, the k was 1, so it's just e to the minus 2 squared is 4t. And that's the solution to this initial boundary value problem. Once you understand it, it is not hard. And if you had a type 1 problem with an arbitrary f, all you would do would be find the sine series, which would be an infinite sum of sine terms, and 
then extend it with the corresponding exponentials. Okay, so now let's go to Desmos and at Desmos I also did a type 2 problem. and I'll show you. Okay, so um, the red curve is the initial temperature distribution for the problem we just discussed. It's a 2 sine x minus sine of 2x. Um, that's what uh, the first commands show you. When, when I entered the solution, Desmos asked me if I wanted to add a t-slider, which I did. I chose the intervals and the step size. And now the purple one, uh, that is a zero flux example, where at t equals zero, the initial temperature was one plus two cosine x minus cosine two x. Okay, so now let's watch the movie, and you'll see that the red temperatures all go down to the ice bath temperature of zero. Uh, because the temperature is being held fixed, and you'll see that the purple temperatures all converge to 1, which is the average temperature of the initial temperature distribution. It's the A0 over 2 term in this very short Fourier series. <laughs> it's just pretty cool. So we're now up to like 2.5 in our time units, and uh, the red energy is almost all sucked out, and the purple energy is all almost uniformly distributed. And there we go. How cool.